Hey everyone, welcome to Ask More Footprint. My name is Nissa, and if you're new here, we are a family of eight who live off grid in Australia. Uh, I have another food prep video for you. It has been a few days since I put a video out. Uh, my apologies. It's been um, just busy. Uh, we're in the middle of the month too, which means that there's less mass food prep that needs doing but also it's just been busy we've got uh, chicks hatching in the incubator but we also found a nest in one of the outdoor chicken pens and they didn't seem to know what to do with the chick once it hatched out of the egg so we saved that one I'll put a photo up here I've got a short little video that I just put up in my stories of the new chicks so we've got two incubators going and they're hatching at the moment uh, but we also ran into issues with temperature now I only have fairly cheap incubators at the moment I'm looking to upgrade them but for next spring probably um, but it got down to four degrees overnight which is pretty chilly for this time of year and inside the house we don't have fire or anything going and we've actually because we've removed all the walls we've actually got vents open and everything to the outside at the moment while we're still doing this construction which means it got down to like 10 degrees inside the house and the incubators couldn't keep up so I had to wrap them put warm water in them and hope fingers crossed that we get a better hat rate because these were purchased eggs uh, so a fair bit of outlay to get them uh, that I'd really like at least a sort of a 50% uh, hatch rate would be really good to make up that cost factor uh, but yeah so we've had a bit going on with that uh, we've got the hamper coming this weekend so I'll have plenty of stuff to do once we do that and I ordered two this month um, so we'll sort that out but I've got the end of the main food prep here and then the videos that I've done since then have been uh, more the everyday using what we've already prepped from that point forward I actually did a test run of my pizza dough again last night. I've done the same recipe that I've written down a few times now before sharing it to make sure that it worked and I'm very happy with it. So I did a whole video on pizza dough and the making of the pizzas and then um, that I will put together as well. So that'll probably come out early next week. So we'll do the do this one today, we'll do the hamper ones over the weekend and then we'll probably get that one out next weekend, early next week. And then I've got a few other bits and pieces as well. We're making pies and all that sort of thing, cleaning out the freezer, using what we've got to try and assess and get through that seven week and then assessing what I'm going to need to purchase for the next cycle as well and working out when that's needed. But for the moment, this is just one of my standard voiceover food prep videos for your enjoyment I suppose for your watching pleasure or however you want to put it uh, so we'll get to this one I'll get this one voice over and then we will see where we go from there so as I said this month is a little bit about using things that we haven't used stretching food and rethinking quantities and what we need as the season changes both the season weather wise because we come into winter and we eat differently and we drink differently in winter we have less cordials less soda streams but we have more hot drinks and things like that uh, and hot breakfasts rather than cereal and all that sort of thing so we're you know that the seasonal change of that but also the seasons of the kids so the youngest is almost nine and then the next were almost 10 and they've really hit those pre-teen uh, eating periods all of a sudden so the portion size has had to be significantly increased the snacking has changed it's altered in what they used to eat to what they eat now uh, and the quantities that they're consuming and the nutrient density that they require to get through from snack and meal to meal so I'm assessing all of that over this uh, seven week period as well for knowledge of what I'm going to purchase for the next shopping period but also how the just changing some things up for the winter season and being aware of it and being mindful about food and what needs to be done what ends up being wasted and things like that which I do every month anyway but there's definitely been a shift for this one uh, one of the things that we've experimented with this month is using the stovetop pressure cooker which Susan sent me and I'm very grateful for that because it was something that I had thought about for ages but just hadn't got around to buying we bought some whole chooks on sale at Costco. They were two dollars off per pack, and they were only three—I want to say three fifty a kilo, three ninety nine a kilo maybe. And they were big two and a half kilo chooks, so a really good buy that, that this month. We've been regularly doing them in the cooker. So what all I did was I threw them in the freezer hole as is. Uh, then all I do is I, t I open them up, I take the pad off them, the little. <laughs> 
absorbent pad and that is not always the easiest thing on a chook that you've frozen whole but we we get there and then I cook it under pressure for 70 to 90 minutes depending on the size of the chook all I do is I put uh, probably a quart of water in the bottom a couple of big cloves of garlic sometimes half a lemon a bit of vegeta, uh, vegeta on the top of it or in the liquid and put the whole chicken chicken in there you are supposed to put the chicken on a rack uh, I can never find my rack and it's really not that big a deal only if you were then going to broil it or something afterwards and you wanted it to look like a roast chicken but we're not serving it up as a roast chicken it's just a whole chicken cooked and it turns out perfect as you're pulling it out of the pressure cooker it all falls apart all the meat comes off it and it Two and a half kilo chook is a fairly, it's only just enough to stretch for a meal with us. So long as I've got plenty of sides, so we do uh, a kilo of steamed veg and probably a kilo and a half to two kilos of potatoes mashed up and gravy and then sometimes some sort of bread or there's a pudding or something for dessert. The other thing we decided to give a go was freezing half a pork roast to put in the cooker. So what we did is we, when we tested out the chamber vacuum sealer uh, and we had half one of those Costco roasts, we vacuum sealed it up and we stuck it in the freezer. So one of the days all I did was pull that out and cook it Kahlua style. So I cooked off some bacon in the bottom of the pan, then put the pork in. Uh, I have found that this pressure cooker being so small and so runs quite hot, and it spends a fair bit of steam it needs a fair bit of water so I definitely put more liquid in there than I would normally use but it, we're okay with that it's going to be flavorful by the end of it anyway I um, put a little vegeta over the pork but then realized that I normally add crystallized pink salt so I just did a little bit of that as well because that's part of the whole Kahlua pork thing and then I put the lid on and I cooked it under pressure for 90 minutes while that was cooking I also put some potatoes on to cook and the kids really enjoyed that whole baked potatoes that I did in the foil on the charcoal grill while James was here for Easter. So I'm sort of mimicking that, but I'm just using the barbecue. I've actually run out of charcoal. Daryl can grab me some when he goes to Bunnings tomorrow. Uh, so I wrapped the, I pierced the potatoes, wrapped them in foil and stuck them in the cast iron baking trays that I use on the barbecue and put them in the barbecue to roast. Uh, I actually used a... Uh, temperature probe to check the internal temperature I googled what the optimal temperature for a whole roasted potato is and I used that to check for cooking like th that they were cooked in there just to make them nice and soft and they were they were beautifully soft and fluffy so that temperature really did work uh, I also did some garlic in foil the same way because Daryl and I really like that roasted whole garlic for dinner I pulled the baked potatoes out, I cast, cut across in them and push from the bottom so they end up looking like that sort of flared roast potato thing which is always lovely. Uh, and then I scooped the perfectly pulled pork over the top and let the kids top them further however they wanted. So I, I didn't get a photo but I did a sort of a, you know, a, a load of potato bar. So there was some dairy free cheese, some salsa, uh, baked beans, black beans, corn, they had whatever they wanted on top of those baked potatoes with that pulled pork. Now I did only cook one potato per child and there was a few of them who would have eaten too so I will have to remember that for future reference as well. Again with that whole altering the quantities that I cook compared to what I used to cook and things like that. It also depends of course how much toppings they have with them. If they're just having a bit of pork and potato it's not going to go as far as if they're also eating the black beans and that but I didn't enforce it. I let them top them however they wanted to. The next day it was quite chilly so I decided on soup for dinner and in the interest of using some of the stuff I've previously pre prepared I did lasagna soup. So I, I really prefer fresh made pasta for lasagna soup. It just seems to hold its texture better. It thickens the soup nicely without sucking up all, all the liquid and turning it more into a bake. Now the pre-bought, um, the bought pre-made lasagna sheets works really well too but I have tried it with like spiral noodles and stuff like that and they just fall apart and it sucks up so much liquid that it ends up almost solid almost like a bake so I don't recommend using that sort of pasta I definitely recommend either the fresh lasagna sheets you can buy in the deli section at the supermarket or making your pasta fresh for this so I made, but I started off by making my pasta and I do a standard sort of a mix. It's 400 grams of flour, three whole eggs, 100 grams of starter and 60 grams of olive oil. Now, if I wasn't using starter, I would use an extra egg um, and then just add a little bit of water if needed to get the texture right. 
you want to bring it together in a food processor I use my Thermomix until it's in the little small balls uh, then I tip it out onto the dough mat and I bring it all together with my hands now because it's got starter in it it means that the dough initially the dough is going to look a little drier than you would normally want pasta dough to be so you still want pasta dough to not be as wet as your finished project because you're going the flour is going to hydrate in the 30 minute rest time that you have but it does more so if you've got starter in there so the starter hydrates that uh, that flour more thoroughly than if you were just adding water so it ends up being a little bit dry and crackly when I first pull it together but so long as it's holding together into a ball then that's fine and then over the couple of hours that I leave it on the bench it gets quite uh, soft and flexible uh, you can then roll it after that time or put it in the fridge to roll it uh, but and use it in the next couple of days uh, it just depends on when you're going to need to use it for that dish so you can make it ahead of time or not if you make the pasta and you need to store it what I tend to do is, is I roll it out and then I cut it and then I freeze it flat on a tray and then I put it inside Ziploc bags in the freezer I don't like to keep it too long because uh, the texture does change but it works quite well short term I then tipped a couple of jars of stock into the pot and two of the frozen containers of bolognese that I really should have planned ahead and pulled out earlier because getting them out of those containers was not the most fun in the world. I brought the stock up to a simmer to defrost the bolognese. Uh, now, for some reason, I don't appear to have any further footage of the soup making. I'm not entirely sure why. I think it's because I was doing other videos at the same time and so therefore I forgot to put the camera back on I'm not real sure uh, but once the meat was defrosted and mixed into the stock I assessed the flavors now the bolognese is already full of veg and flavor and lentils and all that sort of stuff as well so it's not like making a veg uh, lasagna soup from scratch which if I had of I would have been cooking off all the veggies before I added the stock and things like that that was already in the bolognese so all I did was add a little bit of Worcestershire, some salt, a bit of tomato paste if needed to bring up that tomato flavor or a jar of my tomato soup or pasta sauce if needed for that sort of thing and just tweak it till it tasted good. I then rolled out the pasta after its few hours rest. I use my KitchenAid attachment to do so, working from the thickest setting all the way down to the thinnest. Now, my pasta roller is not a KitchenAid brand, it's a generic Amazon brand, and I think eight is, well, eight is the thickest and one is the thinnest on mine, and I think it's opposite in a KitchenAid, so someone told me, but I always start at the thickest, I put it through, I fold it in third so that you've got your nice straight edges, and then put it through again, and then I go down two or three notches at a time and work it all the way through to the thinnest setting. I like to go to the thinnest setting because it does get thicker as it sits because it springs back a little bit. Uh, so I like to go down to the thinnest setting. Now I didn't have a pasta rack because it broke, it was a while back, um, and I have been sent a new one, thank you very much, but I uh, didn't have it when I was doing this video but next time I do pasta I'm definitely going to use it because I put it on my Amazon wish list and it was sent to me very grateful for that uh, so I'm going to next time I run pasta I'll run it through that but this particular time I just hung it over the ends on a tray it wasn't such a big deal because it was going in soup so if it stuck together I wasn't going to freeze it if it stuck together a little bit it wasn't a huge issue so that's what I did this particular time I'd also mixed up some of my flatbread dough. Again, I seem to have skipped a bunch of stuff filming. I think, it, as I said, I think it was because I was doing another video. I think it was the um, the citrus hot cross buns for the hot cross bun video. I think I was doing that the same day. And therefore, I've sort of missed some of the actual food prep that I was doing this day to film the hot cross buns. But regardless, I'd done up some flatbread dough that I was testing out using in a different way. The weather was quite chilly, so the dough really wasn't doing what I wanted. So I decided to just make like a flat garlic bread, pizza bread type thing uh, to go with the soup. I actually didn't particularly like this, but Daryl and the kids adored it. So, you know, I'll give it another go and I'll see if I can get it more to my liking. But everyone else really liked it. I oiled some baking paper and much like a focaccia, I just gently stretched it to the edge of the pans and let it proof a little longer while I was getting the rest of the stuff together. I peeled some of my giant elephant garlic cloves and used my garlic grating plate to grate it up into a puree. I probably could have used my Thermomix if I washed a bowl, uh, but I'm pretty sure everything was dirty and it was shortcutting in a long-winded kind of a way because <laughs> it was really hard on my hands and it didn't really save me any time. I probably could have washed a bowl and done it in the Thermomix in the same amount of time, but anyway. Uh, 
I grated up as much as I could on the grating plate and then chopped up the leftover slivers. Now, I have a lot of problems with pincer grip with my hands, so I could only go to a certain point and then I couldn't hold it anymore. So all I did was chop that last bit up. And then we had the different textures of garlic in there too, which isn't such a bad thing. I then mixed it up with some ghee and salt and put it aside to use. So we've got this sort of fresh elephant garlic butter there to use. A little bit of fresh parsley or something would be really nice too, but I don't have much of anything in the garden at the moment. Uh, and yes, there was the hot crust bun, so I just thought I'd show you here that my oven was already in use because as I said, I was not, I was doing those hot crust buns. So this was the two blueberry batches of hot crust buns from the video about the hot crust buns getting a ghee brush after they were baked. And this is not the garlic ghee, of course. Uh, so that's what was else was going on while I was doing it. Back at the soup and it's tasting good and it's about 30 minutes before I want to serve it. So I'm bringing it back up to the boil and adding in the pasta. You do want to make sure to pull the pasta apart as you're adding it to the soup, otherwise it will stick together. Uh, so you sort of want to pull it apart and put it in piece by piece. As soon as each piece is coated, coated with that uh, fatty um, tomato based sauce, it stops sticking together, but it will stick together if you just dump it in there all in one lot. Ask me how I know that one. Stir it as you go uh, so that the pasta is moved around in there too, but it does seem to so long as you just pull apart as you put it in, as soon as it has a coating of that soup on there, it stops sticking together. Uh, the bread had proofed as much as it was going to in these temperatures, and it's almost time for dinner, which isn't as much as I would have liked, but edible, you know. I spread the garlic ghee over the whole thing liberally, and then I scored it lightly with my pizza cutter and put it in the barbecue to bake. Once it was baked, I pulled it out and I cut along those scores. As you can see, it didn't puff up a whole lot. I would have preferred it to be a bit more proofed, a bit more like a focaccia with some nice big bubbles, but we were working with what we had. Uh, I thought it was, as I said, I thought it was very, it was fine. It was just quite, um, it wasn't particularly airy. It wasn't, it was a very soft uh, bread. And that's not normally what I would like to dip in a soup. I like a sourdough. I like something with a nice chew to it and with texture enough that you can sort of scoop some soup on it and it's not going to break off in your bread, in your soup. This wasn't that, but <laughs> everyone else loved it. So I was probably just being picky. I served up bowls of lasagna soup with it and it made a nice warming meal regardless, a very filling warm meal. And that it probably was tasted really good because of that garlic butter in the end. So the bread probably could have been however, it turned out, but with that garlic butter, it was going to be good. The next day I did rolls. I think I'm still trying to find my unicorn of a recipe for rolls. I make one and Daryl says it's even better every time. And so then it pushes me to make it slightly better again. I actually have hamburgers on the menu for the next few days. So I will give this another go. And if I'm happy with it, then I will share it then. But uh, yeah, I think I keep on tweaking it to try and get it exactly how I want it. And Daryl keeps on telling me it's even better, it's even better. And then I think, well, maybe I'll tweak another thing. I need to stop tweaking. Uh, so I can't remember what I was intending to make with the rolls, but this was the day that Karvik managed to slice his heel open and Daryl had to take him to the emergency room. So I think I was baking them with the intent to do something with them for dinner. Uh, but then he cut his foot and in the end I gave up. Uh, so I think I let the kids help themselves with it. It might've been leftover pulled pork maybe from the baked potatoes, or I could have warmed up some bolognese, or it could have even just been ham and cheese or bacon and eggs, or actually it might've been bacon and eggs. They might've had breakfast sandwiches. Anyway, I can't remember. I cooked up the buns and I let them have them however they wanted. I used an egg wash on them and everything and the everything but the bagel seasoning because I just really like it and I had it mixed up. Uh, I really like that everything but the bagel seasoning on everything. Bagels, buns, uh, I like it sprinkled over fried eggs uh, or even in um, scrambled eggs. I've actually just added it. I've got a bunch of, a batch of sourdough cracker dough sitting on my bench ready to be rolled out and I put a whole bunch in there which can be an issue because when you're rolling out the cracker dough it can break the dough a little bit but I like it enough that I will deal with that. Uh, so then there was a couple of days of coddling Karvik, dealing with the wound. There was another trip to the emergency room because it just didn't look right. There was the plans for Easter and trying to get some of the construction done on the buildings before James came so that it, you know, it felt like we actually accomplished something. So I just didn't feel, film much in the way of the kitchen. Obviously we were eating a lot of leftovers and really simple instant food. So there's a couple of days where I basically have no footage on my camera at all, which is very unusual because normally I just 
put my camera in the kitchen and I film it and then I turn it into videos later. But obviously I didn't. Uh, so the I did make a batch of sourdough pancakes though. I still haven't got my sourdough rhythm back. Uh, I'm really struggling. But the nights have just started hitting lows. As I said, it got to four degrees overnight here recently uh last night and then it's been but it had been getting sort of to 10 for a while there too which will help with my sourdough rhythm because it means that if i don't put my starter in the fridge it will still it'll peak but it'll be chilled enough that i can stick it in the fridge in the morning and it won't have completely flopped before that point so hopefully i can get it sorted and then once we get the fire going inside i can do overnight doughs by mixing the dough and then bringing it inside at night away from the fire and have overnight proof uh, but it's not so hot that it ends up slop which is what happens in summer there's a there's such a there's such a thing to it so anyway it's all been too much brain power which is why i've been using yeast a lot lately uh, i did do the pancakes though so i sometimes do my sourdough pancakes overnight mix them up the evening before and then let them sit overnight and add the baking powder and stuff in the morning and then cook it up but the same day works as well as long as you just give it a little bit of a rest you mix it all up give it a little bit of rest and then you add your baking powder and things like that uh, they i really like sourdough pancakes versus standard ones they have a bit more of a mouth of a heavier more dense mouth feel to them they feel more like a meal uh, they still don't tend to last, like if I if we have them for brunch or whatever, they still don't tend to last as a meal all the way through to dinner. I still need to find I still tend to need to find something else to eat. We ended up having a snack of some sort because it was only pancakes for breakfast. Though we do like to serve them up with bacon and things like that too. So it really depends on how we serve them up. But they definitely feel more like a meal when they're sourdough based ones rather than just standard ones as well uh, even better is a dutch baby pancake but the thing is that we have to have enough eggs for that because they take 18 eggs per tray so you know that becomes a difference so sonnet helped me cook all those up she really enjoys making pancakes uh, so she helped me to get them all in the pan flip them over once i made the first batch just to get it all started and get the pan on the right temperature because anyone who's made pancakes knows that getting that first few batches done and getting the pan to the right temperature is important to get the rest of the batch done so that was everything for this video because then we come into the easter weekend which i've already shared uh, and then post that we've got the follow-on stuff so that will be where we'll pick up in the next lot of you know food kitchen day in the life based videos uh, so I think this whole kitchen day in the life thing works quite well I think that um, I need to still figure out some of the naming of the videos and that because I don't know if having the exact same name all the way through really works very well but we're getting there uh, still need to try and be consistent if I can get three videos out a week then it seems to keep my views consistent the money consistent things like that so that's what we that's what I've been sort of aiming for but we have just had a lot going on uh, there was Easter that came on there was the injury that was that occurred and then the the healing and stuff like that his immobility and things like that for a while was you know there we've got these chickens hatching at the moment which is causing you know just some more work within the house and then Daryl has a couple of deadlines on some of the D, &D stuff that we're doing so we're trying to get that churned out before the deadlines are required and also to get payment for it before we go shopping because that will every little bit will help uh we've also done a few We've been trying to get some stuff done here, but we haven't managed a lot of it. Daryl's in Toowoomba tomorrow, so he's getting that framing gun tomorrow. And we will try and figure this out uh, to get it sealed up so we can start getting it used, because that would be awesome. Uh, to be able to have, this, to have this extra space staring at me, but unusable is driving me a bit nuts. So definitely looking forward to that. Uh, so we're working on that and there's just yeah, it's just been a lot going on and so it's it's been hard to focus on food uh, and I've been making food to eat rather than food just to fill stomachs rather than food because I want to make it so but I have been filming everything I've done it just means it'll be more days into each video to show the different meals and the way we've used it so we had a rump that I was going to turn into uh, jerky but the we're having issues with the power and we had an inverter blow up and things like that so i haven't been able to use the dehydrator so i used that rump over like four or five different meals in different ways some fried rice some udon noodle stir fry um we had some on pizza things like that so i'll be able to share that 
I went through the freezer this morning and cleaned, de-iced some of the sections that had gotten iced up, which is a, an issue in summer. If you've got the lid open for too long, things melt and create a lot of ice. It's not so bad in winter. So I decided to de-ice that now. Went through what we had left to see what we're going to be using in meals for the next couple of weeks uh, and went through some crates to see, like I was checking, we seem to be low on coffee, but I found another bag of coffee beans, so that's good, uh, and things like that. So we're just working through all of that as well. Um, I don't think there was anything else to really share with anything at the moment either. Um, we're just chugging along. So this was uh, like four or five days of food prep in the lead up to Easter. We'll have the hamper video as the next one that I'll get out and it'll be exciting to see what comes in the, I don't know what's in the fruit and veg barrels or anything yet. So it'll be interesting to see what comes there and we'll see what we need to do with it. I might get Daryl to buy me some sugar in Toowoomba tomorrow, just in case there's any fruit that needs to be turned into jams or anything like that. Uh, so we'll get that sorted and I'll share that. And then we'll just keep on pushing through getting this. Once we've got the framing gun, we'll get some of this done, which I'll share as well. And then eventually we, I got the, uh, I got the mattresses ordered for the kids, new beds for the girls, new beds. We also ordered a, a very expensive, <laughs> was a significant investment and really hard decision to make but uh, one of the Bissell um, carpet shampooers uh, we have these big area rugs so like two meters by three meter area rugs that we use because none of our floors are carpeted uh, and in winter they become really important for warmth and we've got and Robin gave us another one and I want to get a couple for the girls room and but the problem is is that we normally bring them out and we bash them, we pressure wash them, things like that, but they're never particularly clean. And I'd really like to be able to get them clean, clean at least once a year. So while we've got all this floor space here, we're gonna pull them out and bring them here. And we and I bought the carpet shampooer. Now the carpet shampooer is a Bissell brand. It has fantastic reviews on it. So that's the one that we're gonna, that I ended up getting. I got a damaged box model, so it was cheaper than full price, but it was still an investment um, and it's it had to be budgeted in carefully but I think it was really important to purchase to get these rugs before they go into these new rooms and then create smell um and with the cats living inside and stuff now too so I bought that I'll share that when I get it uh not sponsored in any way just this is I did a whole bunch of research and this was the brand that I was looking at so we get, did that but I got the mattresses for the girls room um and I need to buy some decor and stuff to outfit their rooms and then we have to figure out just how we're putting everything so I'll share that as we go anyway I've rambled enough I will see you on the next video which will be the hamper video and then we will see where we go from there bye guys